Today's reading comes from Luke chapter 6, verses 1 to 11, which you can find on page 1033 in your Bibles. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. One Sabbath, Jesus was walking through the grain fields, and his disciples began to pick some heads of grain, rub them in their hands, and eat the kernels. Some of the Pharisees asked, Why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered them, Have you never read what David did when he he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for priests to eat. He also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching. And a, man where, and a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, get up and stand in front of everyone. So he got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it. He looked around at them all and then said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was completely restored. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Mr. Deaker, and please do keep that open if you have it open. Uh, let's pray. In some ways, Lord, we've already prayed. Open our eyes to see again. And we want to really uh, just ask for your help in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. That as we look at these incidents in the life of Jesus, that these words on the page would be alive, that they'd make sense to us, and that we'd hear your word to us, Lord, this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. The school where I'm a a governor has a a theme Bible verse. It has, as that Bible verse, John chapter 10, verse 10, where Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. They're not the only school that has that as a sort of motto. And um, you've got to say, that's the Christian faith, life to the full, that's what Jesus said. And who wouldn't want it? Yeah? The issue, though, is how do you and I experience life to the full, to the fullest possible extent? Jesus says it's through him. Some things in life, are, well, you know, we work them out, don't we? They're common sense. Don't put your hand in the fire. Yeah? Other, pe- other things in life, some people kind of get straight away and other people struggle with, like how to be confident. Jesus says there are, if you're going to have the fullness, if you're going to experience all in life that God wants you to experience, it's only going to be found in and through him because only Jesus gives fullness and eternal life. And it's Jesus who will guide you and me into the right paths in this life too and help us to avoid the dead ends and the sort of wrong turnings along the way. In particular, there's a wrong path that spiritually minded people can very easily end up on. And it starts to emerge in this part of Luke's gospel that we've just had read to us. As Luke tells us about this different group that we met briefly in chapter 5, the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law that were with them, religiously minded people who are not happy with Jesus. Although notice, if you look down to chapter 6 and verses 1 and 2, the issue that they're worried about is not necessarily the one that we might be worried about. We might well be worried about Jesus and his disciples walking through a cornfield, picking the ears of corn. Isn't that, you know, it's not major, but it's not that different from shoplifting, is it? Well, Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 25. I didn't know this was here before I looked it up this week either. If you enter your neighbor's cornfield, you may pick the ears of corn with your hands. 
but you must not put a sickle to their standing corn. Okay, so those were the rules. That was the law. You were allowed, if you were on a walk or going through a field, you weren't allowed to, you know, take a sickle out and start to do the harvest, but you were allowed to pick a few ears of corn as a snack on your way through. So there you go, different times. But the Pharisees are not worried about that. They're worried about this is happening on a Sabbath, a day when God had said, keep it holy for me. The Pharisees, if we want to understand them, we've got to understand that they were desperate for life to the full. They were desperate for God to bless their nation. That was their passion, their heart. And they became convinced that the way it was going to come about for God to bless their nation was if they were the generation that were really, really good at keeping the law of God that you find in the Old Testament. That's what they thought. And uh, so what they, what they did was they came up with a whole bunch of sort of day-to-day -day rules. And they said, listen, if you follow all these rules that we've come up with, then you will be keeping the law of the Old Testament. And that was their approach. Very, very good at keeping rules, or at least trying. That was the Pharisees. And uh, it would seem that, I don't know, that they'd, they'd come across this ancient law about you're allowed to pick ears of corn, but they'd sort of said, well, no, hang on, that's a sort of mini harvest, so you're not allowed to do it, or something like that. For whatever reason, Jesus fell foul of their rules rather than the God, God's law in the Old Testament. Now, that does matter. It matters that leaders keep the rules, doesn't it? If leaders don't keep the rules, then, well, how can we ever trust them? Yeah? And particularly, if leaders don't keep God's law, well, hang on. How can we trust them if they play fast and loose with what God says? And as I say, that's why the Pharisees had come up with these extra rules. They thought they were helping. They thought it was the way to go. And notice when Jesus addresses this, he doesn't get into an argument with them about whether this is a work event or not. Uh, he doesn't try and correct their understanding of the Old Testament. He doesn't say, you know, listen, don't be so daft. They're not harvesting. They're just snacking. Come on. He rather uses this opportunity, if you look down to, well, it get, when we get to verse 5, he makes an enormous claim. In between here and verse 5, verses 3 and 4, he reminds them of a true story from the life of David, the anointed leader of God's people. David found himself fleeing for his life with his men, desperately hungry. The only food he could find was food that had been, a priest had consecrated it to God as a sort of act of worship. So this, pr this food was consecrated to God. David and his men arrive, and they're, 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 I mean, they're, they are really, really, are, they've run for their lives. They are starving. And this food that was set apart for God is used to feed God's anointed and his people with him. And the Old Testament describes it, tells the story, makes no comment. Doesn't say, you know, David did the wrong thing, but, you know, we'll let him off this time. And Jesus picks up this story that David seemingly has, well, he shouldn't really do that normally. And yet, it seems to be okay for him to do that. He's the Lord's anointed. And this is for the Lord's business that he's on, that this food is given to him and his men. And Jesus is inviting a comparison because the Jews of his day, they were waiting for great David's greater son. They were waiting for the anointed one, the Messiah that we've been singing that word in the last song. They were waiting for the one that God would send, who would save the nation. And Jesus is saying, well, that's who I am. He doesn't say it in so many words, but that's what he's implying. And then he goes further by this claiming, verse 5, to be Lord, to be boss, to be the one in charge of the Sabbath. And we might be scratching our heads. 
even us, we, you know, not steeped in the Old Testament like the Pharisees were, but we're thinking, hang on a minute, Lord of the Sabbath, that's, that's God, isn't it? He's the one who's in charge of what happens on the rest day, on the Sabbath day. And we're back into the territory that we were in uh, a couple of weeks ago, chapter 5, verse 21. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Who can set the law for God's people but God alone? Pause on that thought. We'll come back to this in a minute. But can you begin to hear the good news, the difference that Jesus make, makes, that for your life and mine, it's not religious rule makers and naysayers that should be governing your life and my life and what we're doing and how we're behaving. No, we don't tr follow someone like that. We follow in Jesus someone who cares for and provides for his people. Someone who has come to, well, we'll come back to this in a minute, to fulfill what God's purposes were when he gave the Old Testament law. As I say, we'll come back to that in a moment. We're not told what the Pharisees said next. We, we're running through the story first, and then we'll think about it. We're not told what they said next, but you don't have to read very far to see that they are less than impressed. Uh, if you look down to verse 7, it says they were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. Why? Well, it's another Sabbath, and into the synagogue has come a poor man. His right hand is, is withered, I guess like a branch of a tree or something like that that you see um, in autumn when all the leaves have fallen off, the opposite season. And you see that, and his hand was like that, this poor man. He, he couldn't do anything with it. And he walks in and everyone's aware that he's there. And the Pharisees are acutely aware. It's a Sabbath. What will Jesus do? Verse 8. Jesus is fully aware of the situation. He could have tried to diffuse the tension, couldn't he? He could have said, he could have you know, got one of his disciples and said, listen, go, go and tell that chap. Uh, when the meeting finishes, half an hour later, we'll be, out, we'll be outside, uh, we'll meet in the marketplace, and um, we'll just do a, a, a healing for him. Uh, no one else needs to know. Or he could have addressed it publicly, couldn't he? He could have said, um, I know there's a lot of tension around this issue, and just to reassure everybody, uh, if we all come back tomorrow, and, um, and then wonderfully we'll have something to celebrate, because this man will be healed. He could have done something like that. But instead, look what he does. He brings him uh, into the middle, doesn't he? Uh, where's that? Yep, uh, verse 8. Get up and stand in front of everyone. He's the centre of attention, poor bloke. And then he asks a question which gets to the heart of things. What is the purpose of God's law? In this instance, the law on the Sabbath. Is it, verse 9, to do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy it? Why did God make up these laws in the first place for his people? What was his heart in it? Jesus is asking. Did God somehow want to squash people and make their lives more difficult? Or do his laws reflect good desires for people? Life to the full, if you like. Well, the answer comes in what Jesus does next. Stretch out your hand, Jesus says to the man. Can you imagine doing that? You've had no use of your right hand, your right arm. You can't pick anything up. Can't work with it. And Jesus says, stretch out your hand. He did so. And his hand was completely restored. It's, it's, it's extraordinary. Who is this? We've just been singing, haven't we? That can do such things. And in what we've just read, in these two different Sabbaths, and in this contrast between... Jesus and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who were with them. We see a contrast between two hugely different ways to approach life. We see a contrast between actually lifeless religion and life-giving, life-full Jesus. 
Lifeless religion is where the Pharisees have backed themselves into. It's the, it's the dead end they've gone down. They've made life all about rules and traditions. You've just got to do your absolute hardest to keep all the rules, is what they were doing. It leads to them being really critical of other people. And in fact, in both of these examples, they're condemning other people. Even, if you read to the end of it, verse 10, having seen this astounding miracle, a man healed, his life restored, what's their reaction? Verse 11, instead of glorifying God and saying, Jesus, we're going to listen to you from now on, they are furious. They're furious with Jesus. And they start saying, well, how can we get rid of him? And you think, how can someone, how can someone be in such a mindset that, that that's how they respond to Jesus? But that's where they were. That is the rules-based way of living life and of religion that they've got into. It's such a contrast, that lifeless religion, with the life-filled Jesus. He, he, shows, he shows in his actions um, how full of life he is in restoring this man. He actually shows it in an everyday as well in providing food for the disciples when they're en route. This Jesus is all about life fulfilling God's purposes in the Old Testament, in giving a good law, he leads us into life. And it is an either-or with Jesus and rule-based religion. It's not that we can follow Jesus but do it by the, by the book, by having lots of rules. We do it by the book in the sense we follow the Jesus we meet in the Bible. But it's not it's not a kind of tick box, follow the rules way of following Jesus. It's following him. It's listening to him and doing what he says, which is slightly different. It's just a slightly, it's a, it's a, well, no, it's not just a nuance. It's relationally very different because we're trusting what he says. We're trusting a person, not following a list, not following regulations. Uh, this, the fact that these are different and so different, they're not compatible, is what we've just had at the end of chapter 5. Jesus has used this picture of new and old wine, new and old wineskins, new and old clothes, and he's given the examples at the end of chapter 5 of how they, they just don't go together, they can't go together. And rule-based religion and following Jesus, it's not just that they're different, they, uh, 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 you know, different and incompatible, yeah, but you know, you choose the one that's best for you. That's not the message here. It's saying one is lifeless, it's broken, it's, it's oppressive actually. And the other is life-giving, it's life-full. And that's what Jesus is actually suggesting when he says he's Lord of the Sabbath. He's saying, if you, remember, if you know the Old Testament, if you go back to what the Sabbath was for, it's all about relationship with God as well as rest in God, rest in the community, it's about some brilliant things. They had a day a week to teach the people to have God as their number one, to value their relationship with him above all else, to make sure that work didn't take over their lives, to make sure they had time with family and community. That's what Sabbath was all about. And so for Jesus to come along and heal on a Sabbath, well, that's very much doing what Sabbath is all about. It's restoring things to how they ought to be. It's giving this life, his man, his life back. And throughout Jesus' ministry, he does this. He fulfills the Sabbath, both in the, in the sense he actually keeps the laws himself, but he fulfills the intention of Sabbath, this restoration of relationship with God, this newness that he brings, this life that he gives this rest that is found in him. Ultimately, he does that through his death and his resurrection. That is the door that he opens back to eternal rest with God, eternal Sabbath, everything right with God forever and rest for our souls now. 
So the New Testament in the book of Hebrews talks about that final day when we'll be with him. That, that's the Sabbath, the true Sabbath that we're heading towards. But we taste it now, we come into it now as we put our faith in Jesus and our sins are forgiven and we know the hope that he brings and we receive the Holy Spirit into our lives. It's why, as we read on in the New Testament, we discover that all those kind of Jewish laws about Sabbath and festivals and so on, that they're not, they're not, we don't need to follow them all anymore uh, in order to please God because Jesus fulfills them and he brings us to rest, to Sabbath, which means that we're not bound any longer by those laws, which is why, for example, Christians from very early times, uh, they started meeting on Sundays, not on Saturdays. They felt totally free to do that because it was a clear day. They could get people together on that day. It was the day that Jesus had risen from the dead. Even though the law clearly says it's sundown on Friday till sundown on Saturday. But they started meeting on Sundays because Jesus fulfilled the law. But you see, this is the thing. He's fulfilled the, the law. We're not under the law anymore. But actually, God's good purposes in giving the Sabbath, well, they still stand, don't they? We need rest from our work. We need to renew our relationship with him. We need community around us. They're all good things. And that's what it is to follow Jesus. It's to enjoy the good things that God always intended when he gave the law, but to have them fulfilled, filled out, to have a freedom as we uh, follow Jesus, which is not about ticking off boxes and following a set of rules that don't make any sense to us. And actually, just a moment before we conclude, it's not just religious and spiritually minded people nowadays who are kind of quite tick boxy, let's follow all the rules. Not necessarily, to, no, not tick boxy, it's principled. It genuinely is principled. But I, I was at a conference recently and they just observed that in the 1960s, people thought life to the full was all about breaking the rules, wasn't it? Throwing off the rules. You know, people have been too restricted. Get rid of all the rules, flower power, do what you like, smoke what you like. And hey, peace, man. That was the sort of, sorry, I wasn't there. Missed, I missed it by 13 days, the 1960s. But anyway, um, and I would have been too young. But that's what I gather. That's the, that's the sort of vibe I get as I hear about the 1960s. It's throwing off the rules. Now and with the kind of environmental crisis and with the uh, needs of the world, um, there's a, a rise instead of that, of no, life to the full is about taking responsibility. It's about doing the right thing. It's about following actually a, a reasonably kind of detailed set of principles on what that looks like in terms of what you eat, in terms of what you wear and where you shop. There are right decisions you can make and there are wrong decisions you can make. And well, we want to encourage you and if, if you kind of listen to the messaging, kind of push you in the right direction. That's the sort of vibe I'm getting from how it's sort of feeling. And I mean, I'm, I'm not, I don't use this sort of social media stuff, but the whole thing that if you say the wrong thing or if you think the wrong thing, you can be canceled and treated as a non-person and you think is that not a little bit like what the pharisees are doing with jesus isn't it he is doing good he has healed a man but he broke the rules so they're furious and want to get rid of him sorry that's overly dramatic i wasn't meaning to do that but isn't that the same vibe that this sort of happens with people when they say the wrong thing in the news again in the paper I look at I look at a couple of different things but there's JK Rowling who's said the wrong thing consistently I say she said the wrong thing she said the wrong thing for some people and so there's this pressure to disassociate yourself from her 
This is not in my notes. I need to get back to my notes or else this is going to be a massive diversion. It's a really important thing to think through together as we engage in this culture, particularly anyone who is spending time with younger people, because this is the part of our Western culture that they're most exposed to and they most feel the pressure of. This pressure to be the person who outwardly does and says all the right things on this sort of list of new moralities that you have to conform to. And Jesus says, that's not actually going to make us moral. It's actually as we listen to him, as we follow him, that he will lead us in the right way. He will lead us in the way that actually is the fulfillment of, all, of, of true morality, of, of true goodness. But without the, the negative of being critical and condemning of others, but rather leading judgment to God and following the one who leads us into the way of love. You see, with Jesus, there's not a list of rules. There's actually only one rule, but it's entirely comprehensive. <laughs> one law is love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, that's not going all wishy-washy and mushy because actually love has a shape. Love has purpose. Love has passion. Love has direction. Love is an expression of who God is. And so actually love fills out into life in all kinds of detailed ways. But can you feel that that is different from rules and laws and trying your best to keep them all and remember them all? It's following one who lives love and teaches love and leads you and me into love. That is fullness of life. He will reshape us to be in the image of the God who loves us and sent him to save us. The question this morning really to end with is who and what, who or what are you and I relying on? I think that's the contrast here. We see this contrast between the Pharisees who teach the law and Jesus, between lifeless religion and life-filled Jesus. What are we relying on? Are we relying on a keep the rules way of life to make us right people to give us life to the full or are we relying on Jesus to make us right with God to give us life to the full to give us rest for our souls and Sabbath are we following rules as we get up on a Monday morning as we approach work as we approach the week? Or are we following Jesus, his example, his teaching, his words, and allowing him to lead us into a full life of love?